Well, there may be no food in this room, but I hope John Whitty and I can give you some nourishment nonetheless. Uh, I'm delighted to share the platform with John. He's a very dear friend, uh, gracious, generous, and forgiving. Uh, the time will be split equally between us, but you'll note the, there is an imbalance of history between our great nations. And Mary Ann Glendon reminded us last night of the importance of the date of 1776. Uh, uh, I once had a history master who told me the problem with America, it has too much geography and not enough history. <laughs> Human rights are big business. Historians and theologians lay claim to them as having their origins in the Judeo-Christian traditions of the West. Humanists see them as the fruits of the Enlightenment. Politicians take credit for their articulation in the pan-national covenants adopted by governments since the Second World War. They are seen as a bulwark against genocide and terrorism and a mechanism for the micromanagement of petty disputes between neighbours. Freedom of religion or belief is but one part of the raft of human rights and needs to be understood in the context of pragmatic, real politic in which communities operate internationally and domestically. Mary Ann Glendon, in her magnificent and insightful lecture yesterday evening, made reference to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which was adopted by the UN in 1948 and evidences common values and shared aspirations, those necessary for peaceful and wholesome coexistence. Article 1 reads, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Leaving aside the gender-specific language indicative of the era in which the document was forged, the language is powerful, born free, equal in dignity and rights. But the word I wish to dwell on uh, for present purposes is endowed. Endowed with reason um, and conscience. But endowed by whom? This term raises the central question. Um, it has a loaded meaning. One finds the Godhead at the heart of many expressions of human rights instruments. Freedom of religion or belief is not additional or supplemental. It is foundational and central. But how did this come about? Why did the post-war drafters of international human rights documents reach out to faith and spirituality in defining, describing and asserting the nature of human rights? The title I have been given, Historic Hinterlands, I am sure was carefully chosen. It raises no expectations of systematic, authoritative and comprehensive coverage. On the contrary, it positively invites the superficial and impressionistic, the partial and the subjective. And when it comes to partial and impressionistic, I am in a class of my own. <laughs> If you have any doubts about my credentials as a legal historian, soon I will have dispelled them with proof positive that I have none. <laughs> so come with me. Come with me on a tour of a metaphorical gallery where we will pause and study a few canvases but pass by many others with barely a glance and not a word of comment. Fans of Bing Crosby can think of this as walking in a hinter wonderland. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's going to be downhill from here. But I have entitled it The Seven Ages of Religious Liberty. I start with classical natural law theories, then medieval antecedents, a universal, homogeneous, coercive church where departures from doctrine were heretical and seditious. The myth of Magna Carta and its so-called freedom of the English church. The Reformation, the English church's break from Rome and the persecution of non adherents Restoration and enlightenment, the beginnings of toleration and the piecemeal lifting of legal disabilities on dissenters. And the 20th century, where religious freedom became uh, emboldened in the common law with exemptions from generally applicable laws. And then to the present day, the Human Rights Act, putting religious freedom on a statutory footing 
and prohibiting discrimination on the grounds of religion. Our journey takes us from a coercive conformity with the Christian faith to state-sponsored pluralism, where all religions, belief systems and worldviews are permitted to flourish, secularism being but one of the worldviews entitled to equal respect alongside others, be they theistic or non-theistic. So I start with classical natural law propositions. Aristotle, writing in the 4th century BC, spoke of justice as a state of mind that encourages man to perform just actions. Uh, Just meaning lawful, fair and virtuous. He divided political justice into natural and conventional justice. The content of natural justice or universal law is set by nature, which renders it immutable in all communities. In contrast, Conventional justice comprises rules devised by individual communities to serve their needs. Conventional justice was subject to change, depending on the government of the day, and is therefore subordinate to natural justice. Cicero, in Dura Republica, uh, wrote this, There is indeed a law, right, reason, which is in accordance with nature, existing in all, unchangeable, commanding us to do what is right, forbidding us to do what is wrong. It is eternal and immutable for all nations and for all time. Cicero's ideas were to shape the pattern of thinking about natural law for centuries. He was a significant influence on the Elizabethan jurist Sir Edward Cook, whose rhetoric was taken up across the Atlantic in the writings of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And in the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas was confronted by a dissonance between classical Greek philosophers for whom the source of law and of reason was to be found in nature and the church itself which believed that these things were derived from God. A human law creates a moral obligation to obey if it has been promulgated by a lawmaker and if it is just or consistent with a divine reason which meant that it it promoted the common good, did not exceed the lawmaker's authority and did not impose a disproportionate burden on individuals. Shortage of time requires me to pass over the nasty, brutish and short Thomas Hobbes and the legal positivism of Jeremy Bentham and his promotion of utilitarianism. But that developing understanding of the theory of law was a powerful influence on the emergence of human rights. It was Hobbes who began to speak about law in terms of rights, a concept unknown until the 1400s. And the first use of the phrase human rights is said to be in 1742 by one George Turnbull. So moving next to the medieval period, here the jurisdictional boundaries of the English royal common law and the Roman papal canon law were stable and broadly settled. English canonists applied law which came from one of three separate sources the papal canon law of Rome, the native and provincial laws of the church in England, and the use commune of Western Christendom. Broadly speaking, the common law and the royal courts dealt with temporal matters, while canon law and the ecclesiastical courts dealt with spiritual matters. But this distinction is notoriously artificial, given the intersections between secular and church life and government, hence the famous Stubbs Maitland debate. And as for the courts, before 1066, there were hundred and shire courts which dealt with spiritual and temporal matters. Under an ordinance of William I, spiritual cases were removed to the church courts. And it was a conflict of authority between church and royal courts which led to the dispute between Henry II and Thomas Nemore, and Thomas Beckett, forgive me, which did not end well. Uh, certainly not for Beckett. The liberty and autonomy of the church had none of the hallmarks of religious liberty as it is understood uh, today. Moving then to the myth of Magna Carta, the Great Charter of 1215 expresses the autonomy of the church and it expresses it most particularly in chapter 1. The English church shall be free and shall have its rights undiminished and its liberties unimpaired to observe in perpetuity 
the historian Chaley traces this to archiepiscopal decrees of Archbishop Stephen Langton and politically to William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke. He was evidently an important figure as his stone effigy in the temple church where I worship has featured in Dan Brown's historical treatise, The Da Vinci Code. <laughs> The freedom of the church, spoken of in Magna Carta in 1215 and its successive iterations, was a freedom of institutional self-governance for the church in a civil context and said nothing of the individual conscience. The issue was political, the respective coercive powers of church and state. Writs of prohibition protected the royal courts and were issued against the exercise of jurisdiction in a particular case by a church court. A prohibition could be withdrawn if a party satisfied the royal judges that the matter was spiritual. The decision as to what matters were spiritual and what were temporal, therefore, lay with the common law courts. The church had an unquestioned jurisdiction over marriage, bustody, inheritance and the punishment of moral sin. The appointment of clergy to benefices was for the bishop. Tithes were the subject of a complicated division of authority. Defamation could be treated in the church courts, as could laying violent hands on a cleric, something doubtless we have all wanted to do from time to time. <laughs> we come then to the Reformation. Much of the character of the Church of England arises out of its break with the Roman Catholic Church during the 16th century. Its legal characteristics have been defined as follows. The law of the Church of England is part of the law of the land, which is regulated by government through primary or delegated legislation and the ecclesiastical courts. Bishops and archbishops are appointed by the Queen on the advice of the Prime Minister. A number of diocesan bishops sit in the House of Lords and are part of the legislature. The Queen is the head of the Church in the same manner as she acts as monarch for the state. Following the Reformation, the Church of England became, in many ways, remained a national church. The people of God in England were, as a group, almost entirely synonymous with the population. On matters of faith, therefore, they spoke through the same organs as on all other matters, namely through their representatives in Parliament. Indeed, matters of religion and state were not really distinguishable. There was no wall of separation. Instead, a shared and undivided garden. The Reformation statutes of the 1530s led to the ousting of papal authority, the liberation of the Church of England from foreign jurisdiction, but also with it came religious intolerance, intolerance towards all other religious groups. And since citizen was synonymous with member of the Church, other religions most notably Roman Catholics and extreme Protestant dissenters, suffered legal disabilities. Oaths were to be taken acknowledging the royal supremacy, and those who failed to attend church uh, were penalised. Moving then to uh, toleration and the issues of, of the dissenters, with the growth of religious tolerance in the late 18th and 19th century, people became entitled to choose which religious denomination to follow. Members of the established church, therefore, became a subgroup of the entire population. In fact, as the disabilities placed on nonconformists and Roman Catholics were lifted, the people of God now included many who were not members of the Church of England. So membership of the Church of England, therefore, was now a subgroup within another subgroup, even though their church remained the established church. Accordingly, the laws made by the state which governed the established church were no longer laws made by the people of God for the people of God, but rather laws imposed upon them by the state. Here, in deference to my colleague Norman Doe, I embark upon a Welsh diversion. Some of the Roman soldiers uh, um, uh, occupying Wales during the Roman occupation were probably Christians. Following the departure of the Romans, Christianity continued to maintain a strong foothold in Wales as a result of the Age of Saints, 
By the end of the 12th century, Wales had been divided into four dioceses, which were part of the province of Canterbury under the auspice of the Archbishop. By the 18th century, the overwhelming majority of the people of Wales belonged to the established church, with a small minority belonging to the Protestant dissenting groups, such as Baptists, Congregationalists, Presbyterians and Quakers. A revival of religious practice in the 19th century was marked by the growth of nonconformity. I'm told that a nonconformist chapel was opened every eight days in Wales during the first half of the 19th century. And there was a common perception that the established church, which was generally led by English bishops, was much more English in outlook than nonconformist denominations, and that this established church was not truly in touch with the people of Wales. So under the Welsh Church Act, every cathedral and ecclesiastical corporation was dissolved. All Welsh bishops were removed from the House of Lords. The coercive force of the church's courts was abolished, and all tithe that had previously been paid to the church in Wales but were diverted to the local authorities. Furthermore, the monarch was no longer permitted to appoint bishops and private patrons to appoint incumbents. And the Welsh Church Act provided that from the date of establishment, the ecclesiastical law of the Church of Wales shall cease to exist as law for the Welsh Church. Prior to that date, the ecclesiastical law which had been applicable to the Church of England in Wales was part of the law of the land. The ecclesiastical courts in Wales ceased to have any jurisdiction. Uh, the church, uh, ecclesiastical law in the church in Wales ceased to exist as law but continued to apply in the same way as the terms of a contract to which members of the church agreed to be bound. Church in Wales in this way can be compared with any other non-established religious group treated legally as voluntary associations to the extent that their rules are binding on the members and on the association uh, itself. The rise of toleration, here the accession of the Protestant William and Mary, led to limited and piecemeal toleration. Most notably, the Toleration Act of 1689 allowed dissenters their own places of worship, provided they met with unlocked doors and with notice of the local Church of England bishops. However, the Test and Corporation Acts were not repealed. In 1714, the Schism Act forbade nonconformists from having their own schools, but this was repealed in 1718. Now, amongst the dissenters, uh, the Baptists were a major component. They wanted the Reformed Church to play its part in civil society. In sympathy with the Puritans, they believed that reformation had not gone far enough. The Church of England had inherited too much from its Roman predecessor, and the Baptists and other dissenters felt they had no choice, therefore, but to form their own church and separate from the false Church of England. With the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, a second wave of persecution began until the Toleration Act of 1689 saw a genuine but limited religious freedom uh, for Baptists. These early dissenters argued that the King and Parliament had no authority over the individual's conscience or his or her religious convictions. The head of the church was not King James, but Jesus Christ. When the issue was one of religious practice, freedom of worship and association, church government and doctrinal conviction, Baptists argued for liberty for each congregation and freedom from the state's interference. And in the febrile political atmosphere of the early 17th century, and especially following the failed coup by Guy Fawkes and his Catholic co-religionists in 1605, any expression of religious dissent from the prevailing Church of England settlement achieved under Elizabeth brought only greater curtailment of liberty for separatists as well as for Catholics. To argue that the state had no jurisdiction over the conscience, rooted in an implicit doctrine of natural law and in scripture, was a dangerous political act. In the eyes of the 17th century English state, it was the duty of the king and parliament to impose religious conformity upon the population. And the principle of religious liberty is unmistakably asserted 
even to those with whom one vigorously disagrees, be they Catholic, Jew or Turk, an expression we can now take to read as Muslim. The Baptist Thomas Helwes may have been influenced by a fellow lawyer at Gray's Inn, namely the Italian Protestant Alberto Gentili, who emigrated to England in 1580, where he later became Regis Professor of Civil Law here in Oxford. He was a defender of religious liberty and wrote in about 1590 that religion is a matter of the mind and will which is always accompanied by freedom. The soul has no master save God only, who alone can destroy the soul. Religion ought to be free. Helwes refers to the sovereign rule of Christ the King above the human conscience and under those and who, whose sway even the earthly King James must submit. Helwes' stance is not derived from an appeal to universal human rights, but rather from en an encounter with Jesus in the scriptures. However, the General Baptists in 1678 withdrew somewhat from the radicalism of Helwes and appealed to natural law, or as they put it, the light of nature. The tension remains. Some Baptists privilege a radical religious freedom of conscience with its concomitant tendency to individualism, while others seek limits upon religious plurality in service of the good ordering of a society that reflects Christian principles. Thus, some will support the religious rights of Muslims to worship and build places to do so, while others are fearful of an erosion of Christian Britain and argue against such liberty. So what had begun as a theologically grounded plea for religious freedom was transformed into a broader concept of human rights. Two decades after Helwes, Roger Williams, at least for some period of his ministry, a Baptist, enlarged the freedoms applied in the settlement of Rhode Island that he founded in 1632, from religious liberty to earthly matters, arguing for the rights of the indigenous Indians to the land upon which the settlement was built. But here I risk trespassing into the territory of John Whitty. It was a leveller, Richard Overton, who had links to the Baptists, who first argued for human rights for all persons, including religious liberty, economic rights, and full participation in society. The full concept of human rights was first developed and articulated during the free church struggle for the right of religious liberty in Puritan England uh, in the 1640s. Overton's arguments were based upon scripture as authoritative and from principles of natural law. He argues for freedom from religious coercion, from government established church and from taxation for religion. He advocates freedom of the press, the right of prisoners not to be tortured, starved or extorted. In terms of the right to life, he argues for the care of widows, orphans, the aged and the handicapped, and the right of the poor to maintain their portion of land. So one fountainhead of human rights, at least, lies with these early Baptists and these advocates of religious liberty, derived from those convictions that an implicit natural law ethic and one which is mediated through scripture. Then what of religious freedom in the common law? The lifting of the disabilities continued throughout the 19th and into the 20th centuries. This led to a development of the concept of religious freedom. In the 20th century, this protection of religious freedom was furthered by limited overlapping protection afforded by the Race Relations Act of 1976, the granting of exemptions from generally applicable laws, the recognition of conscientious objection to military service, and the conferral of some positive rights. But this, though spasmodic, did not amount to a general right to religious liberty. At common law, religious liberty existed as a broad and largely negative freedom, rather than a positive right. Legal mechanisms generally favoured individual freedom of action. In the absence of a legal prohibition, people under the common law were permitted to do as they wished. 
And although the common law was able to define certain long stop boundaries uh, when the circumstances so demanded, the stance adopted by the legislature and the judiciary was generally that of, a pass of passive accommodation as opposed to prescriptive regulation. And moving then to the present day, to the Human Rights Act of 1998 and the Equality Act of 2010, uh, these pieces of legislation have marked a further and substantial shift, uh, the Human Rights Act in particular, by promoting religious freedom as a positive right rather than a negative accommodation. The Act provided domestic courts with the jurisdiction directly to enforce the rights and freedoms articulated in the European Convention. The codified rights enforced by the Act and the different rules of interpretation clashed with certain aspects of the English constitutional heritage, bringing judges more clearly into the political arena and leading to an increase in litigation. And moreover, the Act has been followed by a plethora of laws affecting religion, enacted, interpreted and administered in the early years of the 21st century, most notably new laws on religious discrimination, which cumulatively may be said to be indicative of an abrupt shift from passive religious tolerance to the active promotion of religious liberty as a basic right. So to conclude, we have travelled a distance. We have travelled from classical understandings of natural and divine law, the monolithic faith of Western Europe, where Christian belief and citizenship were coterminous. We've passed through periods of persecution, which has yielded to periods of toleration, then to piecemeal accommodation and to exemptions from general laws. And today we have a positive right to freedom of religion in both associational and personal forms. And I see our current state of affairs as healthy pluralism and not, as some doom-laden voices suggest, pure secularism. If I were to gaze into my crystal ball, I would suggest that one of the unintended consequences of Brexit might be the strengthening of religious liberty in the United Kingdom. I say this in the same manner that through inadvertence it may be that Donald Trump articulates a wise, a wise policy. Restoring the flexibility of the English common law from the, descriptive, the prescriptive blunt micromanagement of EU directives might allow a better balancing of competing interests, might permit a greater uh, allowance for reasonable accommodation, and might shift the argument from rights, human rights, onto human dignity. That discussion is for another day. I look forward to Sir Mark Headley's judicial input tomorrow morning. But our comparative study at this conference does not feature continental Europe. Instead, we look westwards to what, across the Atlantic to the United States, on whose religious settlement few are better informed than my dear friend John Whitty. This brings us to the end of our tour. Please leave by the gift shop. <laughs>
uh, to be in the church between services. And I made bold to wander up onto the pulpit, and while up there, I saw a very thick sheaf of notes from the sermon. Well typewritten, many, many pages, and having sinned as boldly as I had, I decided to page through the text. And I noticed about 17 pages in that there was a nicely typewritten text and then a big red mark in the margin where the pastor had written to himself, weak point, speak loudly. <laughs> so I shall be speaking loudly. <laughs> the historical hinterlands of religious liberty that will occupy me here lie in the American founding era of 1760 to 1820. To be sure, like their English counterparts so ably described by Mark Hill, my dear silken friend, the American founders in this era drew deeply on the rich Western legal tradition that Mark has laid out. They too were inspired by classical and liberal and republican theories of liberty. They too were inspired by Magna Carta and the common law tradition and its developments especially in the tumultuous 17th century, giving us the Petition of Right of 1628, the Toleration Acts, and Bill of Rights of 1789. But the later 18th century in America was also an era of political revolution against the mother country of England, and the unleashing of a new constitutional experiment of guaranteeing religious freedom to all and religious establishment to none. These guarantees set out in the new federal and state constitutions of 1776 to 1791, defied the millennium-old assumptions inherited from the Western tradition that one form of Christianity must be established in a community and that the state must protect and support it against all other forms of faith. America would no longer suffer such governmental prescriptions and proscriptions of religion, the founder said, all forms of Christianity had to stand on their own feet and on an equal footing with all other religions. Their survival and growth had to turn on the cogency of their word, not the coercion of the sword, on the faith of their members, not the force of the law. This bold constitutional experiment of religious freedom remains in place in the United States, although as we shall hear over the next several sessions, it has become ever more controversial and convoluted, especially in recent decades. But let me use my precious time here to sketch out a few of the enduring lessons from the founding era and their echoes and implications for the ongoing American experiment in religious freedom. Let me use as my guide one of my favorite founders, John Adams, the great Massachusetts jurist and the future American president. Writing in the context of the United States Constitutional Convention of 1787, Adams offered a robust appraisal of the new American experiment in the making. He wrote, and I quote, the people in America have now the best opportunity and the greatest trust in their hands than providence ever committed to so small a number since the transgression of Adam and Eve. This is a new era in history, and we are breaking a new pathway to liberty. American governments are now only an object of curiosity, but they are destined to spread over the northern part of the globe. The constitutions now made in America will not wholly die out for thousands of years. It is of the last importance, then, that they should begin right. The task is waiting. The eyes of the world and the eyes of the Lord are upon us." End quote. 231 years later, Adams' sentiments prove remarkably prescient. For all of their failures and their shortcomings, and there were many, the 18th century American founders did indeed begin on the right path toward a free society. And today, Americans enjoy a good deal of religious, civil, and political freedom as a consequence. American principles of religious freedom have had a profound influence around the globe, at least the northern part of the globe, as Adams called it. And they now figure prominently 
in a number of national constitutions and international human rights instruments forged by political and religious bodies. To be sure, as Adams predicted, there has always been a glorious uncertainty in the law, as he put it, and a noble diversity of understandings of the details of what religious liberty entails. This was as true in Adams' day as it is in our own. In Adams' day, there were competing models of religious liberty that were more overtly theological than his, whether Puritan, Evangelical, Catholic, Quaker, or Anglican in inspiration. There were also competing models of liberty that were more overtly philosophical than his, whether neoclassical, republican, liberal, or libertarian in inclination. Today, these and other founding models of religious liberty have borne ample progeny, and the great rivalries amongst them are fought out in the courts and legislatures and academies throughout the land and increasingly throughout the world. Prone as he was, to a dialectical model of religious liberty, Adams would likely approve of our rigorous rivalries of principle, so long as all the rivals themselves remain committed to the constitutional ideals of governmental democracy, rule of law, and ordered liberty for all. But Adams would also likely insist that we reconsider his most cardinal insights about the necessary dialectical nature of religious freedom and state concern for religion. Too little religious freedom, Adams insisted, is a recipe for hypocrisy and impiety, but too unbridled religious freedom is an invitation to license and criminality. Too firm a religious establishment breeds coercion and corruption, but too little state concern for religion allows anti-religious prejudices to become constitutional prerogatives. Somewhere between these extremes, Adams believed, a society must find its balance. One key to striking this balance, this constitutional balance, lies in the 18th century founder's most elementary but most essential insight, that religion is special and needs special protection in the Constitution. We cannot repudiate that decision, Douglas Laycock has written, without rejecting an essential feature of constitutionalism, rendering all constitutional rights vulnerable to repudiation if they go out of political favor for a time. Although America's religious landscape has changed, religion remains today a unique source of individual and personal identity for many involving duties that we owe to our Creator and the manner of discharging them, as James Madison put it. The Founders' vision was that religion is more than simply another form of speech and assembly, privacy and autonomy. It deserves special constitutional treatment and protection. The Founders thus placed freedom of religion alongside freedoms of speech, press and assembly giving religious claimants special protection and restricting government in its interaction with and interference with religion. Religion is also a unique form of public and social identity, involving a vast plurality of sanctuaries, schools, charities, missions, and other forms and forums of faith. All peaceable exercises of religion, whether individual or corporate, private or public, properly deserve the protection of the First Amendment. And such protections sometimes require special exemptions and accommodations that cannot be afforded by general laws. The tyranny of the majority, both Madison and Adams remind us, is particularly dangerous to religious minorities. A second key to restriking this constitutional balance lies in the 18th century founder's insight that to be enduring and effective, the constitutional process must seek to involve all voices and values in the community, religious, non-religious, and indeed anti-religious alike. Healthy constitutionalism ultimately demands competent pluralism, as John Anuzu has put it. Thus, in creating the new American constitutions, 
the framers drew upon all manner of representatives and voters to create and ratify these new organic laws. Believers and skeptics, churchmen and statesmen, Protestants and Catholics, Quakers and Jews, civic Republicans and Enlightenment liberals, many of whom had slandered, if not slaughtered each other with a vengeance in decades past, now came together in a rare moment of constitutional solidarity. The founders understood that a proper law of religious liberty requires that all peaceable religions and believers participate in both its creation and its unfolding. To be sure, both in the Founders' Day and in subsequent generations, some Americans showed little concern for the religious or civil rights of Native Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans, and others, and too often inflicted horrible abuses upon them. And today, some of those old prejudices are returning anew in bitter clashes over race and immigration and in fresh outbreaks of nativism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia. But a willingness to embrace all peaceable religions in the great project of religious freedom is one of the most original and compelling insights of the American constitutional experiment. As John Adams put it, and I quote, religious freedom resides in Hindus and Mohammedans, as well as in Christians and Jews, and Cappadocian monarchists, as well as in Athenian Democrats, in shaking Quakers and in sturdy Presbyterians, in Tartars and Arabs, in Negroes and Indians, indeed in all people of the United States, he wrote in 1792. A third key to restriking this constitutional balance lies in balancing the multiple principles of religious liberty that the founders set forth in that frugal 16-word phrase that comprised the opening of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The Founders designed the First Amendment to provide twin guarantees of religious liberty for all. The free exercise guarantee outlaws government proscriptions of religion, actions that unduly burden the conscience, that restrict religious expression and exercise, that discriminate against religion or invade the autonomy of churches and other religious bodies. The no establishment guarantee outlaws government prescriptions of religion, actions that unduly coerce the conscience, that mandate forms of religious expression and activity, that discriminate in favor of religion or improperly ally the state with churches or other religious bodies. The First Amendment guarantees of no establishment and free exercise of religion thereby provide protections of the other constitutive principles of the American constitutional experiment, liberty of conscience, religious equality, religious pluralism, and separation of church and state. These three insights of balance were not only part of the original vision of the 18th century founders, they were also part of the original vision of the United States Supreme Court as it created the modern constitutional law of religious freedom. All three of these, in, these insights recur in Catwell versus Connecticut in 1940 and Everson versus Board of Education in 1947, the two landmark cases that first applied the First Amendment religion guarantees to the states and inaugurated the modern era of federal constitutional religious liberty in America. Cantwell and Everson declared anew that religion has a special place in the Constitution and deserves special protection in the nation. In a remarkable countertextual reading, the court took it upon itself and the federal judiciary to enforce the First Amendment religion guarantees against all layers and levels and branches of government in the nation by incorporating the First Amendment religion clauses into the 14th Amendment due process clause. The court created a common and a special law of religious liberty 
for the whole nation. Congress shall make no law, now became in effect government of any sort shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Cantwell and Everson also declared anew that all religious voices were welcome in the modern constitutional process of protecting religious liberty. These two cases welcomed hitherto marginal voices. Cantwell welcomed a devout Jehovah's Witness who was seeking protections for his very loud and unpopular missionary work in New Haven, Connecticut. Everson welcomed a skeptical citizen who sought protection from paying taxes in support of religious school children and their buses. Subsequent cases have drawn into the constitutional dialogue a host of other religious and anti-religious groups, Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox Christians, Jews, Muslims, and Hindus, Mormons, Quakers, and Hare Krishnas, Wiccans, Santerians, and Sumamites, skeptics, atheists, and secularists alike. And Cantwell and Everson declared anew the efficacy of the American experiment's founding principles, liberty of conscience, free exercise of religion, religious pluralism, religious equality, separation of church and state, and no establishment of religion. We need another landmark case or two to retrieve and to reanimate these fundamental principles of religious freedom. The weakening of the First Amendment religion clauses in Supreme Court case law since the mid-1980s has placed too much discretionary power in the hands of the legislatures and the states. Such a shift leaves what should be common national rights of religious freedom too vulnerable to fleeting political fashions and too contingent on a claimant's geographical location. The federal courts, in my view, should provide firm and common religious liberty protections for all parties, no matter where they happen to reside and no matter where they happen to file their lawsuits. This need for a strong, common, national law of religious freedom in the face of grim bigotry and at home and religious persecution abroad was amongst the compelling reasons that led the Supreme Court in the 1940s to incorporate the First Amendment religion clauses into the 14th Amendment and apply them to state and local governments alike. It was also the reason that America and the world embraced religious freedom in the 1940s as a universal and non-derogable human right. One of the famous four freedoms that President Roosevelt championed to rebuke the horrific abuses inflicted on Jews and others during World War II. This vision of a strong federal constitutional law of religious liberty remains essential for America, and the federal courts are still in an ideal position to enforce this law. Strong new statutes protecting religious freedom are most welcome additions, but strong constitutional norms enforced by the federal courts are, to my mind, an essential core of a national law of religious liberty in America. Constitutions work like clocks, John Adams reminds us. To operate properly, he said, their pendulums must swing back and forth, and their operators must get wound up from time to time. We have certainly seen plenty of constitutional operators get wound up of late about religious liberty. But we may well be nearing the end of a long constitutional swing away from religious liberty and witnessing the gradual return to more religion-friendly rulings in the Supreme Court. Certainly recent cases, which the insiders of you will know, Bono and Hosanna Tabor and Town of Greece and Hobby Lobby, Holt, and Town of Gilbert and others, indicate that the constitutional pendulum seems to be swinging back in favor of strong religious freedom, despite all the loud efforts of critics and despite the engrowing indifference of portions of the population, as Professor Glendon documented for us last evening. Moreover, and more gravely, as she also documented, 
The blood of many thousands of religious martyrs, especially in the Middle East, Central Africa, and Central Eurasia, might well be crying out so loudly that the world community will finally be moved to take concerted action in protection of religious freedom, as we see in that new ad hoc form of parliamentary summoning of different nation states to thinking about religious freedom more seriously. As in Adams' day, so in our own, the United States remains well positioned to join other nations to help take the global lead on this. Most of the core principles of religious freedom, liberty of conscience, freedom of exercise, religious equality, religious pluralism, and separation of religion and government, forged in the American constitutional experiment, are now at the heart of international human rights protections. And the work of our constitutional courts remains the envy of the world, even if individual cases sometimes bring howls of dismay and disdain. It is essential that the founding principles of religious freedom remain vital parts of our American constitutional life and are not diluted into neutrality or equality norms alone and not weakened by too low a standard of review or too high a law of standing. It is essential that we address the glaring blind spots in our religious liberty jurisprudence, particularly the long and shameful treatment of Native American Indian claims and the growing repression of Muslims and other minorities at the local level who are not being treated very well and whose claims are not being addressed very well either. It's essential that we show our traditional hospitality and charity to the sojourners at our gates, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and others, and desist from some of the outrageous nativism and xenophobia that have marked too much of our popular and political speech of late. It is essential that we make real and make active the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998 and its insistence on religious freedom as a sine qua non of diplomatic relations with the United States. It is essential that we balance religious freedom with other fundamental freedoms, including sexual and same-sex freedoms, and find responsible ways of living together with all of our neighbors, even if we remember the old adage that good fences make good neighbors. We must assist from mutually destructive strategies of defaming, demonizing, and destroying those who hold other views. Now is the time for everyone to stand together for strong religious freedom at home and abroad, for all peaceable people of faith. Religion is too vital, a resource and root of democratic rule and order and law to be passed over. Religious freedom is too central a pillar of liberty and human rights to be chiseled away or pulled down. Religious freedom litigation is too precious a resource to work through our deep cultural, moral, and religious differences and to sort out peaceably which of our national traditions and practices should continue and which might need to change. In centuries past, and in many regions of the world still today, disputes over religion and religious freedom have often led to violence, sometimes to all-out civil warfare. We have the extraordinary luxury in the West of settling our disputes and vindicating our rights with patience, deliberation, due process, and full ventilation of all the issues on all sides. We would do well to continue to embrace this precious constitutional heritage and help others to achieve the same. For as John Adams reminds us, the eyes of the world and the eyes of the Lord are upon us. <coughs> Please see the gift shop on your way out. <laughs> Wonderful. We've uh, just witnessed two exemplars of compression as several hundred years of history of religious freedom have been squeezed into two 25-minute, 30-minute talks. Um, so if I could have Mark come up to the...
table, we have um, just under 30 minutes for discussion. Uh, there is a roving microphone, so if you could wait till the phone microphone reaches you, that would be excellent. Uh, so the question here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Daniel Yamid, Law College, University of London. Uh, thank you for very stimulating uh, talks. One thing that I was uh, somewhat disappointed in your hearing uh, was the acknowledgement that, as an actor of historical fact, uh, human rights seem to have taken root in mostly, or generally speaking, countries with predominantly Judeo Christian tradition. As an Eastern Christian, I'm very aware of what is going on in the Middle East, for example. And I can tell you, and you probably don't need me to tell you, but you know, there is actually no recognition, or generally no recognition, of the universality of human rights, and therefore one of them uh, the right to uh, religious freedom in predominantly Islamic societies. And that's very understandable, purely as a matter of theology. Uh, yeah, I'd like to hear your comments on that. Thank you. I'm going to say, simply from my experience, um, there's a huge amount to learn from the Muslim world. I think it's, 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 this is a binary conference uh, discussing the UK and, and, and the US, and it's historical. So what we've learned from the Muslim world is very much more recent, and I think will be covered in the papers later today and tomorrow. So your question, of course, is fundamental, uh, and the issue is, is what do we do about it? Do we simply look at uh, the West as the inventor of human rights, which is now seeking to impose on the rest, or do we look at human rights as a gift of human nature, uh, which the West has, through hard and cruel experience, come to us understand and appreciate and begin to formulate in its constitutional texts and gradually uh, help other communities to discover on their own. Is it a little bit like uh, penicillin that's been in, found here as a gift that's now shred to the world, like a wheel that's been created here and, sh and shared with the world, or is it simply our export that we're simply imposing on the rest? My view is that human rights are a gift of human nature, given to us by God endowed, as Mark Hill says, and that the harsh and cruel experience of a set of wars in the West and eventually wars in the world forced us to articulate what the formulation of those particular goods are that we understand in the terminology of human rights. The Universal Declaration of 1948, as Professor Glendon can tell us much better than I, uh, was an attempt for the first time, having watched 60 million people die in six years, having watched the advanced civilizations of the West descend into barbarism. It was an attempt to begin to formulate what are some of the fundamentals of human solidarity, of human community, of human brotherhood and sisterhood, and to put those down in some formulation, if nothing else, as a iconic totem to hold up to which we can aspire in the West and in the rest but also as a mirror in which every religious and cultural tradition around the world could reflect upon its own teachings, its own prophets, its own traditions, and to think through their own sacred texts and their expression over time as to how those would resonate or not resonate with their teachings. The reality is, is that in the Muslim world, in uh, the Hindu world, in the Buddhist world, in the Confucian world, there are tropes, there are teachings, there are prophets, there are exemplars, that bespeak many of the things that we call human rights in the 20th and 21st century. And what's necessary is to find the various Rosetta Stones that allow us to begin to talk together, to understand each other. What's essential is that these, each of these religious and cultural traditions find ways by which they can instantiate those norms in and on their own terms. A good example in the Islamic world is my dear colleague Abdullahi al Naim, who says, we go back to the Quran, we go back to the Hadith, and we go back to some of the early teachings and examples of the Prophet and the first leaders of the budding Islamic world, strip off the three centuries of uh, jurisprudence that are accreted on those texts, and think anew about what some of those fundamental teachings are that the Prophet gave us. 
We see the same thing in Confucian traditions as they go back to some of the earliest teachings and practices and begin to realize that what we're talking about in the formulation of human rights in the Universal Declaration or in various national constitutions actually resonates well with, operationalizes, instantiates, makes pithy distillations of teachings that are true to these traditions. And in my view, those are strong indications of a good way forward. But there has to be a two-way dialogue. The Universal Declaration is the opening of a conversation, not the sealing of a deal. And I think that's what the process is designed to do, to over 100 years or 150 years, find a way by which we can formulate things, not in a 30,000-foot abstraction that nobody really can operationalize, but to give ample margins of appreciation to each community, but also recognize what are the non-derogables that are non-negotiable in how we think about our lives together as human beings in whatever religion, culture, or linguistic group we may find ourselves. End of sermon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please amend with Jim Dorco. Yeah. Uh, uh, Neville Rocco, Adelaide University in Australia. Thank you both very much for very stimulating uh, addresses, but I just had one question is we venture from the hinterland in the foreground. Um, do you see a convergence or a divergence between the approaches we have uh, in Europe to religious freedom and human rights uh, and First Amendment approaches, or is it diverging? Uh, uh, where's the jurisprudence heading in your view? I, 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 I really don't know. Um, I, I, I struggle to find a consistent UK jurisprudence, let alone European, let alone transatlantic. Um, and I've got my crystal ball out once, I'm not doing it again. Hi, <laughs> <coughs> this is a question for Mark, uh, James or at uh, McDonald Centre. Uh, I just wanted to question you a little bit about your optimism for a British regime for religious freedom after our departure from the European Union. I mean, clearly we'll cease to be bound by the Charter of Fundamental Freedoms under the Treaty of Lisbon. But the Human Rights Act will, of course, persist, and there doesn't seem, at least at the moment, though there did seem to be back in 2015, any real appetite for uh, taking on departure from the European Convention as, uh, as well as the European Union. Uh, and so that, I wonder whether that's a little bit more, you know, more, more far off than, than, than you suggested. But secondly, even if we were to acquire a sort of develop a domestic rights-based regime governing, uh, uh, bringing in a reasonable accommodation clause, as you suggested, on religious freedom, would it be such a good idea to shift the jurisdiction from a court that is, broadly speaking, I think, a little bit more socially conservative, made up as it is, made up as the Council of Europe is, uh, Russia and some other countries, that, I mean, uh, countries that uh, not in the European Union but uh, are part of the Council of Europe? whether it would be better to remain in that jurisdiction from a religious freedom point of view, given that there seems to be at least a, quite a sharp uptick in quite hostile attitudes towards religious freedom within the British judiciary, and whether a rights-based regime might simply weaponize a lot of these grievances uh, and, and drive the cultural wars uh, into the corporate. It's wonderful to spend weeks preparing a historic narrative, then be questioned on a throwaway and ad lib. <laughs> but it's a fascinating point, and I'm, and I'm glad you've raised it. Um, because my emphasis, and, and I'm sorry time didn't allow me to develop it more, is less about Strasbourg and more about Luxembourg. It's not about the supranational supervisory court administering an international treaty in Strasbourg, which will continue to be operative irrespective of Brexit, because um, we're not pulling out of that, or at least I don't think we are. It's more to do with the European directives emanating from Brussels, which are, to my mind, overly prescriptive. It creates a formulaic way of dealing with direct and indirect discrimination through various protected characteristics. Uh, and it is, it is brutal uh, in its bluntness. What I think we've lost by being um, uh, parties to those directives which are um, articulated through the Equality Act and elsewhere, 
uh, are, are being punished to an over-regulation. Uh, the advantage of being stripped of that is that we have a far greater judicial discretion to weigh in the balance all sorts of competing interests, such as human dignity, the rights and freedoms of others, uh, and so on. And it won't be so much a binary choice of a litigant wins or loses on the basis of a hyper-regulated European directive. I don't know, but that's my feeling of where the trajectory will take us. Finally, in the Open University, I think I can speak on behalf of all Mark Hill's former teachers in saying how proud we are <laughs> of his Cook's Tour approach to freedom of religion. But can I ask him why he always averts his gaze as he travels the world when it comes to Section 13 of the Human Rights Act 1998, and whether he would cast a little light on it, particularly for the benefit of our American guests here, because Section 13 is an example of what you could call British exceptionalism. It says that courts must have particular regard to freedom of religion when it's invoked by a religious organization. And there are two such clauses, one on freedom of expression. And the phrase particular regard is used elsewhere in English law, particularly in universities, uh, our prevent duty, uh, and our duties in relation to freedom of speech. And it seems to me that there are ways in which our courts, like Mark, uh, neglect this crucial clause, and it's crucial because, amongst other things, the Human Rights Act 1998 wouldn't have been passed without it. It was a concession to uh, bishops and others who were supporting Cardinal Hume, who was arguing uh, extra uh, or outside Parliament. But it was very, very important to anticipate some of the disputes which have actually arisen. Thank you. Those who haven't talked me in the past uh, will, will think I planted that question. Uh, section 13 and its partner section, uh, for those who don't know, uh, are, as uh, Simon says, the product of an unholy alliance between the Lord Spiritual and the Press Barons. Uh, and, uh, and, and Simon is absolutely right that had it not been for the inclusion of those two um, sections, uh, the Human Rights Act would not have obtained parliamentary approval, uh, and therefore the European Convention would not have been uh, written into our domestic uh, jurisprudence. Uh, the difficulty with both of those sections is that they purport to do something which the Convention doesn't allow us to do, namely to establish a hierarchy of rights with freedom of religion or belief trumping other rights or freedom of expression trumping other rights. And because of the um, clever civil service um, articulation of particular regard, uh, uh, it, it, it's a sop to the press barons and the bishops, which doesn't have uh, uh, any uh, effect. Uh, Simon knows very well that I'm not averted by glance, <laughs> because he knows that as uh, an advocate in the uh, Supreme Court, uh, I'm one of very few members of the practicing bar, not only to have argued the Section 13 point, but to have argued it successfully in the uh, Aston Cantlow and Wallbank case, whereby it is now part of the judgment, which says that the um, uh, the, the court must have regard to that freedom. Uh, the, the particular legal point of issue was whether the established Church of England is a public authority, because uh, were it a public authority, it would be excluded from the class of victim, uh, enabling it to bring claims for religious liberty, which would produce the ultimate irony that the only re religious organisation in these aisles which cannot bring a claim for um, a, a, a violation of freedom of religion would be the established church. <laughs> uh, but the only reason I was successful and the only reason uh, that uh, there is a tiny fleeting reference to section 13 uh, in that judgment is because we would have won the case anyway. The section 13 allusion is a, a mere make-weight 
in the um, uh, judicial uh, analysis. I think every commentator and every judge who's had occasion to look at section 13 says it is a meaningless provision. Um, Matt, did you have a question? I do, yeah. Please. Um, I'm, I'm interested from a historical standpoint. I was, I was struck by the fact that so much of uh, religious liberty laws were animated by these conflicts with very intense uh, sects, very intense uh, uh, believers. And the comments uh, from Professor Glennon last night that uh, we see a rise in religious intensity uh, today. I know in, in the US context, um, many of my Catholic friends, uh, very intensely religious, and that has gone hand in hand with an anti-liberalist streak where they've looked at the, the kind of liberal state that uh, we currently have and are very skeptical of it. The question is something like, does, do the religious liberty laws and the accommodations actually remove the joy of martyrdom from people who deeply want it? <laughs> And does that create a reactionary environment such that those people become more uh, uh, fervent in their, their devoutness and more likely to infringe on other people's religious beliefs? It's a provocative question. Uh, the joy of martyrdom is perhaps a bit strong. Uh, <laughs> But I think the premise of your question uh, is the salient part that I'd like to address, and that is uh, do articulations of religious freedom come out of uh, the anguish of persecution and come out of repression? And are the prophets of religious freedom often uh, leaders of those disenfranchised, persecuted, and beleaguered groups? And I think the answer to that historically is clearly yes. In addition to the various examples that Mark Hill lifts up, take, for example, Tertullian, a late second, early third century church father, uh, in the midst of deep Roman persecution, articulates some of the basics, the powerful basics of uh, freedom of conscience and freedom of exercise of religion. Take the Edict of Milan of 313, uh, where Constantine, at the end of a decade long of horrific persecution uh, in the Roman Empire, finally uh, is persuaded that it's better for us to tolerate Christians and to give them freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, freedom of exercise, and freedom of group rights, all of which are articulated in that live document of 313, born, however, out of the bloodshed of the prior 10, decade, uh, ten years uh, of the three emperors fighting and seeking to repress Christianity finally and fully. Um, Every time one sees in the course of the later first millennium and the high middle ages deep uh, religious persecution, uh, are, there arises a prophet who speaks about that fundamental gift of human nature and speaks about the sovereignty of God over the soul rather than the sovereignty of the church or the state or the baron or whoever else is engaging in the persecution. It's not an accident that Mark Hill lifts up the Baptists of the 17th century as powerful prophets of religious liberty. This wasn't their starting premise. They were not about uh, religious freedom in the beginning. If you think about the Brethren, you think about the Hutterites, you think about the Amish in their day in the 16th century, they turned the other cheek and were felled by the sword before they began to articulate many of the premises of religious freedom. But the Baptists and the Mennonites stood up and finally said, this is wrong. And in the eyes of God, we declare it important for us to have religious freedom. And in a long history of this type, one can go through and show that it's the anguish of persecution and the anguish of martyrdom that drives co-religionists, uh, fathers and mothers who are bereaved of their children, begin to articulate these basics. And again, back to my answer to our colleague here, it was the horrific excesses of World War II that forced the world itself to stand back. And with all the participating units led by Eleanor Roosevelt to begin to say, Look, folks, this can't be in a civilized world anymore. And here are some of the basics that we need to think about. I think you need have absolutely no concerns at all that we're going to witness the death of the joy of martyrdom. Uh, the cottage industry of religiously based litigation is, is burgeoning. And the one thing that's uh, always played is that uh, 
the um, protagonist parties prepare two speeches. If they win, they stand on the steps of the court and say, this is a victory for common sense. <laughs> if they lose, they stand in exactly the same place and say, this is political correctness gone mad. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. This is Tim Diep from Christian Concern of London. Um, I wanted to ask Mark, I think I agree with you that we're in a position of something like state-sponsored religious pluralism, which is surely better than state secularism. I wondered how sustainable you think this position is, given that surely it means there's no shared basis of values and shared basis of morality, no common understanding of who this endower is and why he's endowed for what purpose. And that it surely assumes a position of religious neutrality that is actually mythological and unattainable in practice. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that neutrality is unattainable. Um, I, I, I think that um, uh, a sensible government and, 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 a, and a wise civil service can, can, can properly engage. Uh, I think the biggest struggle which we face today is political illiteracy of the world of religion and the world of um, non-theistic belief systems. And uh, r rather than take the easy way out, which is to equate neutrality with secularism, and say so because we can't have common values, we therefore have no values, uh, is, is, is the last refuge of the desperate. Uh, I think there's a duty on, on, on all of us. Uh, to ensure uh, that those who legislate and those who have to decide these tricky questions do so in as fully informed a manner as possible. One PS to that, which is the, the, one of the interesting things that's emerged in epistemology over the last two decades, uh, even with the great skions of liberalism, Jürgen Habermas, John Rawls, and others, is the recognition that there is no such thing as neutrality. Uh, secular liberalism is not simply uh, a neutral system of beliefs and values. It is, in fact, a fundamental belief system, uh, as fundamental and sometimes as tenacious and repressive uh, as the various religious traditions that it seeks to periodically suppress. And one of the interesting things that's emerged, and especially metaphor theory in the last uh, 20 years or so after recur, is the recognition that all fundamental questions uh, of war, of life, of death, of um, the common good, rests on ultimately a sea of metaphors. And that sea of metaphors can have religious or non-religious or philosophical valence, but they are no more, no less fundamental, whether articulated by Jesus, by Allah, uh, by Buddha, uh, or by uh, the skions of Oxford, whether religious or non-religious. Uh, we have one more question from John. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm John Lin Chen uh, uh, from Hong Kong, uh, a faculty member of the uh, uh, Department of Religion and Philosophy of Hong Kong Baptist University, and also a uh, visiting fellow of McDonald's Center. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm interested in the view uh, uh, in uh, Professor White's view that uh, human nature uh, are grounded, uh, uh, human rights are grounded in human nature. Uh, and a gift of God. Uh, I would like you to just uh, elaborate that, that claim. It seems to me that uh, God um, do not allow us to have the freedom of, uh, to, uh, of uh, living Him or not. Well, I mean, uh, you, you said that this is a gift from God, uh, and human right uh, to freedom of uh, religion is uh, is a gift from gift from God as well. But it seems to me that God does not allow us to have the freedom to believe Him or not, mm. well, because otherwise he pun why why He punishes us if we don't if we don't believe in Him. So thank you very much. Um, my view is that uh, we are given human rights in order to discharge divine duties that have been given to us, whether articulated in our natural law, whether articulated in the Decalogue, whether articulated in other normative statements of what it is to lead a life of faith and a life of love of God, neighbor, and self. 
Human rights are not simply an invitation to do whatever one wishes. They are not simply a, um, a wish list uh, of whims and whimsy. Uh, they are, in fact, the opportunity, the privilege that we get to be able to answer God's call to us uh, and to reflect that in our daily lives and in the discharge of the duties that we have at the various relationships in which we are embedded. Uh, whether God uh, insists on our believing in Him is a different question. Um, it's a hard question of um, irresistible grace or predestinarianism. It's a hard question of Armenianism and free will. It's a hard question about whether God ultimately uh, forces us by our nature to obey Him. And I happen to be, while Dutch Reformed in my background, more sympathetic with the view that God would much rather have us freely go to hell than compel us to go to heaven. And God would much rather have us choose him, to be sure, uh, instructed by God's word, instructed by what God has inscribed in our hearts, uh, than to force us to follow him uh, as slaves. Now that's a view that's not particularly um, comfortable uh, in the Dutch Reformed community of which I was a part, and it's not comfortable for those that worry about the old free will communion wars. But in my view, that really, as we think about it as a universal good, that has been given to us is that we have the freedom to choose God. God has already chosen us. We have the freedom to choose God in turn. But, but my question is whether that freedom is given by God or not. Sure. Uh, how, how, well, how do, how do you justify that claim? Well, given that uh, God will punish us if we don't believe in Him. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's almost 11 o'clock. Co co coffee beckons. Um, uh, no, seriously, we, we are at 11, so um, we need to stop this, this session. Uh, but uh, before we go to coffee, we owe uh, our two excellent speakers a loud round of applause. So thank you very much.